glucose paradigm um, when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Yeah, uh, uh, that is the prevailing paradigm with type 2 diabetes is that it is a disease of glucose. Um, and I, I'm often quick to say that's forgivable historically because historically the glucose was the main driver of of diabetes even, or the main symptom, sorry, the main, the main manifestation, the polyuria um, specifically. And that we would see with type one most certainly, um, but we would see it with type two as well as glucose levels were approaching and staying at, you know, those low 200s um, um, milligram per deciliter, that would, that would overwhelm the kidney's ability to reabsorb the glucose and drive the polyuria. And, and historically it was just so much easier to measure glucose. Um, because it's easy to measure a nutrient. Um, however, as time progresses, it's becoming less forgivable because we know that <clears throat> insulin, especially in the context of type 2 diabetes, <clears throat> insulin changes will precede the glucose changes by up to decades um, uh, earlier. And uh, so not only can we detect the problem better if we look at insulin rather than glucose, but we also treat it significantly better because we know from some very well-controlled long-term studies that the more aggressively we treat, um, uh, try to push the glucose levels down in a type 2 diabetic with insulin, the more rapidly they die. Uh, so uh, the, the, the risk of, of cardiovascular mortality goes up three times. The risk of cancer mortality goes up twice so doubled, we, we, we kill the patients and we make them sicker and fatter with the insulin therapy in a type 2 diabetic. And yet we do this in the midst of getting really great glucose numbers. So something's wrong. If glucose was the main driver of this disease, then getting the glucose to normal with insulin therapy in type 2 diabetic should be solving the problem. But indeed, it's, it's making it worse. So <clears throat> that's, that is one of the single greatest professional goals I have is to promote the awareness of insulin as a pathogenic molecule in the context of, well, many diseases, but certainly type 2 diabetes, and not just continue to look at glucose. If we just look at glucose, we look at it too late, and we um, treat it poorly. Now, Sean, I totally forgot what your second point was. That was too long of an answer. No, 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 that's fine. I know there's a lot. So I wanted to address the issue of, you know, the, 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 the main driver of insulin resistance and diabetic pathophysiology. Okay. Fat in the cells, you know, i.e. saturated fat. And yeah. In a podcast, and then also mitochondrial. Okay. Goodness. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with, with regards to the, the origins of insulin resistance, it is multifaceted. Um, and, and some might kind of roll their eyes to hear that and think, oh, that's a cop-out. But please, please know, everyone, that is not a cop-out. I've, I've been studying nothing but insulin resistance for the past 15 years. And uh, I, I can confidently say there are several factors that go into it. Um, uh, including stress, like I could, we could in fact uh, acutely start infusing the main stress hormones, cortisol and, and uh, epinephrine at, at normal, well, at physiological levels that you see with stress, and we could make someone insulin resistant within hours of, of infusing those stress hormones, and cortisol and epinephrine are the main ones. So stress matters, um, sleep matters, although that's actually probably through those same hormones. Mild sleep deprivation, just one night can cause insulin resistance the next day. And it's corrected quickly, thank heavens. Um, inflammation, um, we know people that have um, active autoimmune disorders will have demonstrable insulin resistance while the disease is more active. And then as the autoimmune disease subsides, so too does the insulin resistance like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we also detect that in infections, in acute effect, infections, as someone um, has more inflammation in their bodies. And then insulin itself um, drives insulin resistance. I understand that there is debate. Um, some prominent, uh, even sort of low carb voices are, are, are trying to promote the idea that insulin does not drive insulin resistance, but that is, um, that is not right. There are, uh, absolute undeniable um, evidence, publications that hyperinsulinemia drives 
insulin resistance in the fat cell and at the muscle cell. We know that for certain, whether it's happening at the, the brain cells and, and liver cells and others, that we don't know yet. Um, but we know it happens at the muscle and the fat. There are multiple publications that prove that point. Now, Sean, to touch on the, the, the lipid or the cell becomes clogged with fat, which is what many on the low fat side of the coin want to say. Interestingly, every distinct cause of insulin resistance that I just mentioned, the uh, say cortisol, uh, inflammation, hyperinsulinemia, all of those um, at least partly cause the insulin resistance by resulting in the accumulation of a fat called ceramides. Now ceramides itself, I am saying that word plural on purpose because there's a whole family of ceramides, um, but all of them will drive ceramide accumulation. Now the cell needs ceramides, it's there for a reason, um, but of course, as so often happens in disease, there's just too much of it. And that and ceramides are directly antagonistic to the insulin pathway. So when insulin binds its receptor and it starts initiating a series of biochemical events, ceramide stops that process from happening. So it is directly antagonistic to the insulin signal. Uh, now, the truth is ceramides are made from palmitate, the most common circulating saturated fat. So there is a hint of truth when people say don't eat saturated fat because that will cause insulin resistance. There, I, I'd like to think, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt and I think, okay, you're saying that because of the evidence that palmitate, a saturated fat, causes, um, uh, is the backbone for the ceramide, the, sort of the, the, the initial ceramide molecule. But there's a disconnect. Um, and I had to go through this learning process myself. Eating saturated fat is not the same as having saturated fat available in the plasma, for example, to be pulled in by a cell and turn that pathway on. Indeed, Volick and Finney have published some really great papers finding that you can be eating three times more saturated fat in the context of a low carb diet and the actual amount of saturated fats in the blood as free fatty acids or as um, bound on lipoproteins um, as triglycerides goes down. Uh, that, so there's, there's a disconnect there. When people want to confuse the idea that saturated fat at the cell is a necessary um, substrate for ceramide accumulation, we cannot confuse that with, well, then don't eat saturated fat. No, those two processes are not connected. And unfortunately, we, we overinterpret data. If you infuse saturated fat into a human in, or infuse saturated fat into an animal, or you treat cells like muscle cells directly with a saturated fat, you get a demonstrable, powerful inhibition of insulin um, this, or an insulin resistance uh, more than with unsaturated fats. But that is not the same as eating them. And even still, if that's not enough, there is no animal source of fat that is purely saturated fat. Animal sources, in some instances, as, as everyone here knows, I'm sure, uh, there can be almost, almost a one-to-one -one of unsaturated to saturated. Not generally, it's gonna be more saturated, and I would argue that's perfectly fine. Clearly, evolutionarily, these are foods that we, we cut our teeth on, but we cannot confuse eating saturated fat with high levels of blood saturated fat, there's direct evidence to show that that is not the case. You know, I think you'd mentioned that did insulin actually drive saturated fat in the blood or not? Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I, I didn't say that, but you certainly know that. Yeah, insulin um, drives palmitate formation um, at, directly at the liver from whatever carbons are available, and often that's going to be glucose. Do you know, is there any study, is there any papers on that, Ben, that you know of that, that demonstrate that? Oh, the lipogenesis at the liver? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. several. Yeah. Um, um, and, and even fructose uh, does that. Um, uh, in fact, Luke Tappy, uh, a fructose scientist, I think he's based out of Switzerland. He's, he once mentioned this, I've never forgotten, um, in a paper. Fructose is the most lipogenic molecule. And of course, if you're focusing more on animal products, you're getting no fructose. Uh, 
you may be getting a little bit of glucose from the muscle and that's negligible and of course perfectly fine. But if, if someone's wanting to avoid fructose, say to lower their uric acid and try to control their gout, because that's a main driver of gout, um, fructose metabolism literally is causing um, uric acid production. And if you, the more you shift towards an animal-based diet um, or just natural, you know, well, I, I'll say animal foods, uh, you, you get ever less and less fructose. But yeah, yeah, Sean, the, the idea that insulin drives hepatic lipogenesis, it's extremely well established. Let me, uh, and then the one last other component was that was just a little bit about the mitochondria and its role in diabetes. Cause I know you probably- Right, <laughs> right, yeah, there is, um, um, that's appropriate to mention. And the idea is uh, twofold. As the mitochondria may not be working optimally, it is that you're, you're getting incomplete combustion of fatty acids and these incomplete fatty acid molecules um, exacerbate um, insulin resistance. And second, um, just the production of reactive oxygen species. Uh, so the, the, the drive or that shift in the redox state within the cell and the greater oxidative stress compromises um, I, uh, some distinct parts of the insulin signaling pathway, um, altering um, insulin sensitivity in the process. Yes, so you have to have um, ideal or, or, or the ideal metabolic scenario or mitochondria that are using oxygen well for the production of ATP or for the production or for the production of heat through a, like a futile cycle at the mitochondria, or uh, and and you don't want it to be producing as much reactive oxygen species. Now, you need reactive oxygen species. Once again, this is a molecule that is absolutely essential to health, and there are evidence, there are studies in humans to show that when humans are dosing with excessively high levels of antioxidants like like vitamin E, they die more, mortality goes up. So you can't, you can't, this is not something we want to try to shoot down. Um, we want, we need oxidative stress and it serves a purpose. Uh, but the idea is that if the mitochondria are supplied with more energy than they know what to do with, they end up producing more oxidative stress. And there's some decent, decent evidence to support that. So there's this oversupply um, that isn't matched by the, the mitochondria's need to produce ATP. Um, now I would, add that some of that might be resolved if you could force the mitochondria to be more uncoupled. So when mitochondria are coupled, they will only break down as much energy as the cell needs the work done within the cell. In other words, the creation of ATP. So ATP production will drive the catabolism of nutrient. In the case of an uncoupled or mitochondria that are uncoupled, you've, to you've teased those um, events apart that now the, the mitochondria are catabolizing nutrients like glucose and fat, not because the cell needs a certain amount of work done, but it's just breaking them down to waste the energy as heat. And that's the sort of futile cycle, which is so abhorrent um, to, to normal cells because it just is a waste of energy. But in our environment, um, the modern food environment of, of hyper calorie, well, it ends up that inefficiency, that mitochondrial inefficiency ends up being a, a pretty smart adaptation or a way for the body to expend this excess energy and, and help fight obesity. <laughs>